This is the Wicked Weird Podcast. I'm Josh, and tonight we interview MUFON investigator Michael Klein. He's here to break down multiple universal paranormal theories. Is it possible that UFOs, ghosts, and even Bigfoot share a common source? Let's find out. Mr. Michael J. Klein, thanks for coming on the podcast, buddy. Thank you for having me. Of course, dude. Of course, it's going to be awesome. So before we get into your um, universal, or I don't know how you would best say it, your universal paranormal theory, or an all... Multiple universal paranormal theories. So there's more than one, you know, Yeah. but they're basically each one is a combination of paranormal events happening because of one reason. Or okay. one basic thing. No, we're going to go deep. Okay. <laughs> we're yeah. going deep. Um, before we get there, though, there was a couple sightings recently that I think would be a good example of what you're about to get into. There are also just exciting uh, UFO sightings that happen. Yeah, I mean, particularly because they're mass sightings, which are always uh, the most yeah. interesting phenomenon, because uh, there are multiple witnesses, obviously. But yeah, the two that happened last week... Uh, were basically the one in uh, Charlotte and the one in northern Arizona. And they were similar in the sense that they were both um, orbular lights that appeared. The ones in in, in uh, Charlotte, kind of, there were, I would like to say maybe six uh-huh. to a dozen at any time. They kind there was of, videos, right? There was multiple videos. There you were can look videos. it up. The Charlotte UFO last week. Exactly. And, you know, they seem to obviously form a triangle at certain times, um, and they obviously influence the Uh people that saw them. So these are all common themes that we see in uh, UFO sightings, but also other apparitions, too, which is how we kind of get into the universal theory. So the one in Charlotte, before we get deep, okay, the one in Charlotte was... um, It was above a hotel. Above a hotel. Multiple people saw it. Bunch of people saw it. It was glowing lights, or what you like to call living lights. Yeah, the we'll living that. light. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the, in the commonality, they saw lights. They didn't see a ship. They saw lights. And then in Phoenix, which happened last week too. Yeah. Um, it wasn't in Phoenix. It was in northern Arizona. Okay. So a bunch of townships north of Phoenix did see it. Same thing. Multiple people saw it. Yeah. Multiple videos. These videos looked like the Phoenix lights. Like they were just... It wasn't even that people were just saying uh, UFO equals UFO. These yeah. things looked like the Phoenix Lights. Okay. And just so if people don't know what the Phoenix Lights are out there, yeah, just you so know. you know, in 1997, a thousand people called into the local police stations and reported seeing a gigantic, roughly a mile long triangular craft slowly hovering over the city of Phoenix. People saw lights from a distance, but people who were right below it reported looking up and seeing it like block the entire sky. It was like one guy said it was like multiple football fields wide. Well, anyways, it was an incredible story. It's always the one I point to if like no one believes in UFOs. I always go to Phoenix Lights because I think it's the most credible. When a thousand people see a ship and the governor, Fife Symington was his name, mm-hmm. came forward about seeing it as well. Um, he literally went on CNN and said, I saw a gigantic ship and it challenged my reality. Yeah. Um, so the Phoenix Lights were a landmark UFO case, but I digress. Last week was a little different. Last weekend wasn't seen by as many people. I don't think it would be considered as dramatic in the sense of scale. Yeah. But I think the impact it had on the seers, obviously everyone kind of flashed back in a PTS uh, way. <laughs> to the, <laughs> Yeah, to Phoenix Lights. So obviously it had an influence on the this viewers. Uh-huh. Um, the Charlotte one, actually, even though the lights were all over the place, people yeah. were claiming to see that it formed a craft like uh, oh, formation were... at a certain point. Yeah, oh, it did. I didn't know that. Um, and actually, if you watch the video, you actually the long seven or eight minute video, you can see it for yourself too. Okay, cool. So those lights, how do how, now? How does that tie into your, uh, your the universal paranormal theory? Well, so I guess I. Just to very briefly explain the kind of, like, journey I went on, Mm -hmm. you know, I loved reading case studies of anything, you know, Bigfoot, UFO, ghosts. Mm -hmm. I love the narrative. You are Mr. Paranormal. You're my number one paranormal buddy. Exactly. And I used to kind of tinker around in, like, a little deeper occultism. Mm -hmm. Like, I did read a couple Crowley, more than a couple Crowley at this point, but this is back in my initial journey. I uh-huh. would just read the case studies. Then I picked up Gurdjieff, this other occultist, and... It sounds like a cultist. And I realized that this was what I would call, like, kind of dangerous knowledge and 
I don't didn't know what to make of it. Yeah. Then little by little, I started to stumble upon other literature that kind of wasn't really from the first person's point of view in the sense that it wasn't a, the story of the experiencer being recorded. Yeah. But it was someone collecting the stories of many experiencers. Okay. Um, and that was being collected, and they were basically making uh, assumptions off of mass case studies. Now, there's like, you know, the scientific way of separating these stories, yeah. which is basically claiming them as unexplained or ex explainable. Uh -huh. And then there's the Fortean way. And Charles, the what way? Say that again? Fortean. So maybe you've heard of the term uh, when something's described with the paranormal as Fortean. It's referring to um, one of the early researchers in paranormal story collecting oh, paranormal really? folklore named charles fort and his approach was basically all these stories were coming in of crazy shit yeah and he basically was like look i don't care if they're true or false unknown or known i'm just gonna collect these stories and then someone else can look at this shit from a stand back point uh -huh. of view and maybe objectively just draw some comparisons. So okay. he just went around the country and he wrote the Book of the Damned. He basically wrote a trilogy that was just people's testimonies on crazy shit. And some of it was from local newspapers. It was a very like almost Herodotus was the first history in Greece, the yeah. Greek, and he just went out and let people tell him stories. So he didn't judge him. He was objective. Exactly. He just took in the stories and let people organize them and judge them at face values. You didn't need the guise of science. Maybe something else was going on. Maybe uh -huh. something in the humanities was going on here. Uh -huh. And that's actually where one of the other authors who I read steps in, Jeffrey Cripple, who's I hope I'm, yeah, let's just call him that because I just <laughs> hope I pronounce his name right. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, he write, basically writes about um, looking at everything through the guise of the humanities, uh, which was really interesting. You like, know? what do you mean by humanity? Basically, dissecting things in a veil of how we identify as humans. So you look at things through sexuality point of view mm -hmm. uh you look at things through a hermetic point of view you look at things this is literally he actually gives a step-by-step -step in his book the supernatural which was one of the books he co-wrote with whitley striber uh -huh. who we all may remember right 1987 wrote communion the, right the, i read that as a kid the big alien abduction he pretty much wrote the lore from from anal probes to missing time, <laughs> you know, in that book. He and, went deep, pun intended. But Cripple is a Rice University uh, religious professor who basically looks at the conditions in which religions form throughout uh -huh. history and throughout the world. And he basically saw certain trends about religion that Whitley Stryber was dealing with in his writing. And Stryber okay. went kind of on a scientific journey but Cripple kind of bringing his point of view about understanding how religions form kind of brought humanities into the equation. Writing, literature, poetry, mm -hmm. ways of representing being human into the equation. And that kind of looked at it differently. Um, yeah. And then what you the other day you were talking to me about, um, it was really interesting that a lot of these sightings, a, a lot of sightings, one, involve a glowing light. Which you call living light, yeah, and they also involve a boundary. Um, yeah, can you can you explain that? Because I, I want to know more about that. There are certain themes. So, just to break down, I said there would be multiple universal yeah. theories. Three good ones that I've encountered, and this is as best a wordy explanation as I could give for each, uh -huh. are maybe the Jacques Vallée one, which is yeah. that there's something else out there. And yeah. it's intelligent, and it's fucking with us. Uh -huh. Then there's the Jeffrey Cripple one and Whitley Stryber one, which is starting to think that there's an element of our own humanity, a thirdness besides the mind and body, mm -hmm. an external soul that is affecting us. And it's part of human evolution, and it's like a mirror reflecting a mirror in the sense that it's us reflecting us, and something in that process, that cycle of reflection, uh -huh. is what human evolution is. And then the fourth one, which I'm super loving, and I'm not 100% through right now, yeah. is by Patrick Harper, 
who is basically he wrote demonic reality um yeah and i just funny story i found this book reading negative reviews of the um supernatural book by cripple where there was a very astute user who pointed out that this book this kind of thinking had been done over and over again and one of the books was patrick harper's and he too so he basically yeah. find found once again that there were certain commonalities in stories mm -hmm. that bigfoot fairies ghosts well a lot of people don't know that bigfoot is a lot of bigfoot sightings are but before you see bigfoot people see a glowing light there's Which, the commonalities are like so numerous like even bigfoots and fairies a lot of people think bigfoot is gigantopithecus right or a remnant thereof yeah or even a spiritual ghost thereof right right i've heard all of these things yeah, yeah. people are getting crazy with the way people talk about bigfoot and gigantopithecus is very similar to how people used to speak of the fairies and the picks that oh, the really? fairies were a supernatural natural remnant of a oh. real race that were called the Picts. Oh. oh. And also, there are certain breeds of fairies. you you got to think of fairies not in terms of species, but in terms of what they do in the sense that some... And this is Patrick Harper's explanation, because fairies are obviously one of his favorites. As a valet, Jacques Vallée loves fairies too because he <laughs> noticed the similarity between fairies and UFOs. But we're talking about fairies and Bigfoot really quickly right, right. just to show how two crazy apparitions can be linked together. Yeah, yeah. So fairies and Bigfoot, there's a type of fairy called the brownies, which yeah. are hairy, big fairies. They often will mischievously clean your house for you and organize shit for you. Wow. They're they, retentive fairies. Yes, but they actually are very similar to what Bigfoot sound like. Um, so Bigfoot doesn't organize your house for you. Although Bigfoot's, there are stories. Like, there's one story of a Bigfoot where um, a family would hide a feeding pail. They they started to interact with a Bigfoot. Yeah. At first it scared them. Uh -huh. Then they kind of realized it's neutrality. And it started to play this game where they'd hide a feeding pail and the Bigfoot would find it wherever on the yeah, premises yeah. and put it back. Yeah, now, right. after a while, the Bigfoot actually got troublesome and killed a neighbor's um, chicken. And the last thing the Bigfoot did was <laughs> knock loudly as the woman was taking a shower and scared the shit out of her. And that right. was the last thing you heard. And that kind of feeds into Patrick Harper's theory of demonic yeah. reality. Um, where now he's not using the term demon as in Christianity, right. angels and demons. He's using a much broader term that are called daemons. D-A-I-M-O-N-S. Matt daemons. <laughs> Matt daemons. <laughs> And basically, he the, he brings this term from Gnosticism. Um, yeah. And it's basically the best way I keep thinking of it is there's yeah. this great line that Carl Jung, who is one of the people that Harper comes from the school of. Yeah. Um, he quotes as saying, our diseases, our gods are now all diseases, meaning that these demons actually cause psychological disorders and in a way psychology has tiptoed around dealing with them uh -huh. but there are more direct approaches to deal with these things if you think about them as almost living problems that are created from your subconscious. All right, so wait, I'm confused. So break down what is a what is a Matt Damon? What is a Damon? It is a a cultural construct that is such a hard thing. When Jung talks about archetypes, uh -huh. I think it got twisted in a way of being digested by academia as thinking of it as internally. And it didn't just get twisted because of academia, uh -huh. but it's because psychology is very yeah. much thought of as an internal thing. Right, right. But thinking isn't just confined to the body. Thinking manifests as architecture, art, and culture. So if psychology and thinking has this non-spatial element, why are we to assume that it's just going to maintain within us right. that it won't manifest in certain ways outside of us. I think us. there are studies I remember some I remember watching going deep on the internet at late at night and watching a couple things about how consciousness might not be local that it's non-local. Exactly. That it extends beyond us that we actually all emanate from the same field that we're all the same consciousness. Uh, and now we're getting I mean, into the concept of anima mundi or this world soul. So 
All right, so we have these three universal theories. Yeah, let's back up a little bit. All right. <laughs> yeah. We have valet, something's fucking with us, and it's external. Yeah. We have cripple and striver. striver. We're fucking with ourselves. Our souls are making us evolve. Uh-huh. And then we have Patrick Harper and Carl Jung, who think that there are these the archetypes. Now we always think of archetypes right. with Jung. Jung was a student of Freud. Of he was with Freud. But he broke apart from Freud because of his notions about the collective unconscious. Mm-hmm. And this notion that there is this whole, I don't know, its you can think of it as Taoism, as Star Wars, the Force. But none of these things really capture it as much as the Gnostic term anima mundi. World. Anima mundi. World soul. I like that. But it also has to do with nature. And in a sense, like a yeah. lot of tribal cultures do have this concept of thinking of things as a living soul the best thing that western culture has is it to it is animism which is you know imbuing objects with life i don't want to throw this pen away because i brought this pen with me on my favorite trip up to northern california right right and now that pen means something to me and that's a very like materialistic way of dealing with a very ancient and beautiful and possibly true concept Uh This also was subjected in the idea that the soul could be combined with the mo- with the mind, and thus yeah, yeah. Descartes' dualism, the mind and body, uh-huh. is a very convenient way of organizing things. But really, things are shades of gray; they're yeah, not yeah. that simple. So we have these three theories, and but within these theories, there are certain commonalities. Yeah, and that's where we get to where you started: the concept of living light. And the, also the concept of liminality and living on a threshold. Mm-hmm. And I was actually thinking about this on my run this morning, that time in the present, there's no such thing as the present, that we're constantly on a threshold of change. That's just the nature That's true, yeah. of existing. That's interesting. And I think the Greeks understood this, which is why Dionysus was the god of change as well as yeah. theater and going crazy. Because all those things... Yeah. led to evolution but anyway and that kind of falls into cripples theory yeah so we have the concept of living light in the sense that there's this light force out there no i didn't say that right hold on before you go into that so before it well as i said earlier before bigfoot settings a lot of the time uh people report seeing a light ufos i'll get to that in a second ghosts that's very common before a ghost materializes or an apparition um, people tend to see a glowing light. Yes. Which is odd. And then UFOs is the biggest one. People always report... People report lights more than they report ships. Now, just a quick side tangent. Um, I am a super UFO dork, and the king of all UFO dorks, Dr. Stephen Greer, uh, <laughs> points out that um, if you listen to Greer at all, and I, I don't know if this is true or not, but I find it super interesting that these ships from other places and times, before they enter our dimension... They, they probe us, basically. Uh, not anal probe us. They, uh, they, they basically open up a little portal so they can see in. And when they do that, you're seeing the light of the ship. So you're seeing that light. Whatever that, that light basically represents the ship about to either, either check out our dimension or it's going to all of a sudden jump through. So a lot of times, right before someone sees a UFO ship, they see a living light. Exactly. And... This light, sometimes the light itself is the phenomenon. You know, I've, I've actually seen a couple great videos taken from trail cams or surveillance cams of like what looks like um, what you describe as like a UFO beam coming down. But it's really yeah. just a beam of light that looks more solid than regular light in the sense that uh-huh. the bottom doesn't illuminate the ground. It stops and it comes oh, down. Oh, yeah, you showed me that the, before. That is good. weird. And I've seen this kind of footage and there I've seen lights in the sky anomaly. But these are almost – or this is the orbular phenomenon of yeah. light. Now, there's something about this living light that causes us to – let's just call it hallucinate – but it's not hallucination necessarily. You're not saying that not, what people's experiences aren't real. Are real. Or that they're confined to psychology because there are very real physical remnants of these things. I right. mean, Bigfoot leaves 
footprints. Uh, footprints that they even and have scat. They have they have a collection of hair that's ninety five percent human and five percent unknown that supposedly are Bigfoot hairs. They were collected as Bigfoot hairs. Yeah, yeah. And they're just sitting in college labs. No one really knows what to do or right. how to declare them. Right. So the point is that there is very physical evidence. So there is a physical dimension to this, but this light causes a hallucination within us, and we tend to hallucinate our own current mythologies. So some people will see the ghosts of their dead ones yeah. because that's what their mythology is. Some people see UFOs. Some people will that's see what I Bigfoot. Would see. Oh, you might see a Bigfoot, <laughs> I'm too. All, that's true. I think I'm you'd all see in a on few both. things. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen multiple. <laughs> Maybe a lake monster. In there. But, you know, um, now Carl Jung would come back and explain these things as as archetypes demons things yeah. that pre-exist that are manifesting in our subconscious because of unresolvedness and that are thus being transformed by maybe the filter of our soul into our mind and then re-ejected into the physical realm that's super interesting and also super crazy so in a sense you're saying or young is saying jung however you, however you pronounce it that we're manifesting it that it's, it is physical and we might be actually creating it ourselves. Is that what you're saying? Or am I just a Or dumb? that it's manif... A lot of things seem to think of us as almost like the filter. Yeah. That it does allow... It, it does manifest. But at the same time, like, there are just hints of these things being their own thing as well. Yeah, yeah. You know, Valet even wonders if there's just other life forms out there. And right. they just exist in realms we can't yeah. see or sense. So wait, what do you think then? What do you think is going on? About, uh, out of those three major theories, what are you leaning towards? I love the idea of these things being seen on thresholds. That's really compelling so, yeah, and interesting. Just, I don't know why that rings true to me, but it makes me think like, I don't know, that's the first one where I'm like, oh, that's interesting. We should just Something like mention Something might be going that. on there. It's like, you know, on, on the, it's like the edges of your life where you're the most scared i guess and i think you that's, like manifest this stuff to deal with I don't, I don't know and that's also what i kind of like touched on is that there's no really like standard time we're kind of always on this threshold of change this liminality and so all right so really quickly like the notion that these things happen at thresholds you look at certain um phenomena of like ghosts and the devil yeah. happening at crossroads and bridges Bridges. There's always a sh something yeah. at the bridge. Um, then you get to the notion of like Bigfoot often appearing on the verge of where... Universally seen on the edges of society. Exactly. And people would argue, you know, that that's because Bigfoot lives in the wilderness and that's the only place we'd see him. But I think there is something to the fact that he is seen on the threshold. That maybe these people, he is manifesting in people that are conflicted about agrarianism and urbanism. Yeah. You know, and that is their mythology. That is their form of seeing their own evolution so they they can figure that part out of their own lives. You yeah, know? yeah. Anything else? What else, should, what else should we talk about? I'll cut I this mean, out. I mean, I could literally just go on forever and ever just linking, you know, apparitions and things the way, you know, we were talking yesterday about the sulfur smell and how sulfur, yeah. or I, I don't, um, sulfur is like smell, you know? Yeah. Bigfoot yes. Stinks. Sulfur is a smell. <laughs> Bigfoot stinks. You smell so sulfur when the devil comes. It's an interesting fact is that Lucifer actually wasn't cast into the lake of sulfur and fire to be destroyed or to be punished, but fire, sulfur, brimstone, those are actually cleansing. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah, so he was thrown into the fire to be cleansed. So when you think about these demons as purely good and bad, black and white, it's not really that simple. You have to look within yourself and uh -huh. understand that these demons... Or maybe part of you and external things. And by changing part of you, you can actually change the way your life is externally. That's interesting. So, I don't know.
All right, well, uh, Mr. Thank Klein, Mr. Michael J. Klein, thanks <laughs> thank, for uh, coming on, dude. Thank you for talking to me. Yeah, that was yeah. awesome. You broke it down. <laughs> I hope I did. I feel like I just rambled and rambled, but <laughs> no, no, there was. I, I got it. I don't remember the names uh, clearly, but I got the uh, I got the gist yeah. of it and the three different theories. And um, the, the, I mean, the threshold thing is super interesting. The commonalities between all these different sightings. Yeah, if you really want to just step outside your boundary and go down some rabbit holes, go pick up Jack Valet's Messengers of Deceptions and uh-huh. go read his trilogy. After that, go read The Super Space Natural by Jeffrey Cripple and Whitley Stryber. Uh-huh. And then to drive it home, definitely read Daemonic Reality by Patrick Harper. And you will be so confused and crazy by the end of that journey yeah. that you won't know what to make of anything. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, I got one question for you. Yeah. Uh, you are a officially a MUFON investigator now. Yes, I so, got my papers. I'm excited. To <laughs> you come. got your papers. I love it. Honestly, I'm excited to go into it with a non-extraterrestrialist point of view because I didn't realize that that was such a American and Canadian phenomenon, but a lot of the world does not just assume that it's extraterrestrials or, like, army, you know? Oh, really? There's a lot of things out there, and if you just open yourself up to them, you might surprise what you'll believe. So are you going to try to do, are you going to try to pick investigations that um, fit the mold or fit the universal paranormal theories? I think I'm going to go after, I'm not going to try to fit anything. I'm going to go in there yeah, with probably a purely open, open mind, but I am going to want to take the weirdest, craziest cases. <laughs> Hell yeah. What. Those things that are like, you can't make this shit up, I'm just going to go right after. Nice, nice. All right, dude. Well, on that note, thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me, Ryan. I, I hope to be on again. Yeah, every other day.